Welcome to River's Edge Community Church. We're so excited that you have joined us for our virtual worship service so that we can participate in worship together. Today, we want to continue with part four in our series, Some Truly Good News. And the good news today that we want to focus on is love. Now, for a few months, we have been highlighting things that we love by putting them on the mantle behind me. It started off as a shout out to our son, Dan, and to his wife, Dana. But then we found out that all sorts of people were playing along, but these people didn't have any context and had no idea what these things were. So today, I want to share with you things that I love, not all the ones that we have shown on our mantle, but some of them, especially from the early days, that you have seen and you have wondered, what in the world is that? So first, there was the big bear playing the accordion because many Christmases we got an animal playing an accordion because you cannot have enough animals playing the accordion. This was a gift from Dan. And then way back we have Steve McQueen who is the essence of cool. This was a gift from our son Matt. For Easter we had the rhinoceros. Why we chose the rhinoceros for Easter, I don't remember, but it was a great Easter memory that we will cherish from now on. The rhinoceros, also a gift from Dan. Next Sunday, we celebrated Sweden with the Delana horses. This one's a gift from the Zimmermans. This one has been in our family for quite some time, we think. Obviously, we cherish our heritage as Swedes. Moving on, yes, more animals playing accordions because you can never have enough. Then we had Jonah, Jonah and the whale. Back from when we did the series on Jonah, Dan and Dana gave us this wonderful gift to help commemorate that series. Then we had the elephant made of coal. You can't really beat an elephant made of coal. One of my first gifts from Dana was this finger rat. It has become a very good friend of mine and often helps me write my sermons. Dana gave me this rat because she works with rats and their brains in her PhD program at the NIH. We've had all sorts of wonderful gifts, including this Mother's Day card that Dana painted. We cherish this very, very much. And we have this very special rock, which was stolen off a Viking grave in Norway. This is one of my precious, precious good memories of that trip and a great, great rock. Dan and Dana also gave me this great coffee cup, which is huge, which is wonderful, but is also from Shenandoah National Park. We cherish this cup, I do, almost every day. And last, we have this wonderful rock that Dana brought back from Virginia on one of their trips for my stone wall. These are all things we loved, we cherished. We cherish the memories, we cherish these. These are such incredible gifts to us and we love them all. So here's my question to you. What do you love? We're glad you're here. This we believe, that God is good and loving towards all he has made. But our world rejected God's love and ran willfully into sin. But God, because he is a God of grace, sent his son into our world to redeem us. For Jesus left the glories of heaven and took on human flesh and lived among us. And he showed us the Father, and he showed us love and grace, and he showed us that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus went to the cross and died for us, the just for the unjust. And in his death, we are forgiven. And in his resurrection, we were given eternal life, and in his ascension, we have his sure promise that one day all things will be put to rights once again. And now he calls us to fill the earth with his glory by being his people, by loving others, and by walking in the way of the cross, a life that overflows with humility and generosity, 
a life that seeks to be compassionate and gracious, and a life that reaches out to the people God puts in our path with the gospel of truth and love. For in this way, we will take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I come to your presence to humbly bow down myself, to confess to you, and to worship you and praise you. Lord, we are facing huge temptations to live out our faith in many ways. We are struggling in our current situation. All the relationships are kind of twisted and awkward. We feel a huge need for a loving community, a loving nation, and even a loving relationship with ourselves. We are yearning for being loved, and we are feeling called to love others you put in our path. But often we are off track on loving each other because we are stuffed with fears, worries, and self-centeredness. Lord, you know us. You know how weak and fragile our faith would be when we come to reality in life. Lord, when you ask us to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, I see you are asking us to surrender our whole being to walk along with you. I see you are asking us to be rooted and established in love in Christ. Lord, give us strength and wisdom so that we may see your promise in Jesus Christ through all the various events and happenings 
we are experiencing now. Empower us with your love and peace in all our relationships. Lord, put us to the side you want to use us at this moment to love others with your truth and hope. So in this way, we may not miss the epic chance to understand your will. And in this way, we may glorify your holy name with our lives. This prayer is in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart with all your understanding and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is God's word for us today. Our prayer today comes from Scott McKnight. Scott was a professor when I was in seminary, but I never took a class from him. But since that time, I have learned more from Scott than from any other individual. And his book, The Jesus Creed, reinvigorated my spiritual life, so I highly recommend it to you. But back to today's prayer. This prayer is based on the Jesus Creed, which is just another way of saying that it is shaped by the Twin Commandments to love God and to love others. The Lord's Prayer is simply the Jesus Creed as a prayer. Scott's narration makes that clear. Let's pray it together, and then I'll give you time to lift up the concerns of your own heart, and then I'll conclude our time together with a brief pastoral prayer. Let's pray. Because we love God, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Because loving God means that we yearn for God to make His glory known, we say, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because loving God means we love others as God loves others. We long for all to have the necessities of life. And so we say, give us this day our daily bread. Because we love others, we seek to unleash God's grace of forgiveness and say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because we love others, we long that they will love and live God's will. And so we say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because we love God and because we love others, we lift our hearts to God and say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We say this today, because we love God, and love others. Amen. In these days, Father, of strife and fear and bitterness and anger, give us your love. In these days of indifference, give us your compassion. In these days of trials and stress, give us your peace. In these days of despair and exhaustion, give us your patience. In these days of uncertainty, give us your wisdom. In these days of sadness, Give us your joy. 
In these days of fear and death, give us your hope. In these days of loneliness, give us your love. Come, Father. Come, God of love, and breathe your life into us so that we may love you and love others. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and King. Amen. It was Monday, the 21st of August, 
1911. The Louvre was closed to the public so that workers could attend to the various needs of the building. One of those workers entered the museum and made his way quietly to the gallery where da Vinci's Mona Lisa was on exhibit. Now, he looked like a worker, but he wasn't. He was an art thief. He was also an Italian. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it plays a very important role in the story. Our worker thief, who, by the way, was named Perugia, quickly went to work. He took the Mona Lisa off the wall, put it under his jacket, and then calmly walked out the front doors. Over 24 hours later, someone inquired when the Mona Lisa would be returned to her exhibit. Everyone had assumed a museum photographer had taken her to his studio, but no one had actually confirmed this. And so they asked the photographers, but they did not have it, which meant the Mona Lisa had been stolen. The Louvre closed down for a week as a precaution. But a funny thing happened when it reopened. Huge lines formed to see the spot where the Mona Lisa used to be. Lines that were never there when the Mona Lisa was present. It's hard for us to understand, but up until that time, only a relatively small group of art enthusiasts cared much about the Mona Lisa. Its theft, however, made it an international sensation. Everyone now knew and loved that smile. But as famous as she was, the police could not find her. And for two years, her case remained a mystery. But then, out of nowhere, an Italian art dealer was offered the painting. He immediately contacted the police. Perugia was arrested, and the Mona Lisa was recovered. There was a trial, but it was over before it began. Our art thief willingly confessed to stealing the Mona Lisa, but he said he only took it because as an Italian, he felt all Italian paintings stolen by Napoleon ought to be returned to Italy. The court agreed, and the villain behind the most stunning art heist in the 20th century was sentenced to a year in jail. But then that sentence was overturned, and he was released after only serving a few days. Italy, however, did have to return the painting. But while the painting that was stolen was somewhat famous, the one that was returned was now perceived to be not only the greatest painting in the world, but the most loved as well. I have a book on my shelf about love. It's called Nothing Greater, Nothing Better. I think most of us would agree there is nothing greater than love. Love is truly some good news. James Berry said, if you have love, you don't need to have anything else. And if you don't have it, it doesn't matter much what else you have. Amen. But where did we get this idea that love is the greatest good? In the ancient world, love never held that title. Instead, honor was seen as the highest virtue. In fact, if you look at the 147 maxims that defined what the Greeks in the 6th century BCE perceived to be the greatest good, you would be shocked to see how little they thought of love. These 147 rules were the crucial ingredients that they felt comprised the good life. This list included such things as rule number eight, know yourself, and rule 11, think mortal thoughts, and rule number 22, pursue honor. Those are all fine. Rule 140, don't wrong the dead. Rule 113, accept old age. Rule 95, control your wife. Maybe not so helpful. Love shows up on this list only once, at a number 124. And even then, it's cold. 
love those whom you rear. It can't even say, love your children. 147 maxims and really nothing, nothing about love. So how did love become the be all end all of life today? How did love rise to the top and become everything we ever wanted in life? Simple, we stole love as the highest good from Jesus. Love was Jesus's highest value. It was always on display and so we stole it from him. Before Jesus, honor was the greatest good. After Jesus, love became the highest virtue. And now, all across the globe, we all celebrate love without realizing how this amazing gift came to us. It was stolen. Now, all of that was not meant to imply that love did not have a prominent role in the ancient world. Of course it did. But it always seemed secondary to something else more important, except in the Old Testament, where love was always highly valued. For instance, look at the Shema, the creed of Judaism. Here's the Old Testament's definition of the greatest life. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your strength and with all your soul. Question, what is the best way to live so that you can experience the good life? Answer, according to the Shema, love God with all your heart. But the Old Testament is big. And over time, other commands try to usurp love's place at the top of the list. And so the rabbis began to debate what command was the most important. For instance, there is the famous story that took place long before Jesus about a Gentile who came to a famous rabbi and made this offer saying, I will convert to Judaism if you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. The rabbi smiled and replied, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah, the rest is commentary. What's the greatest good? Love and the golden rule. Now debates like this took place all the time. And so when a teacher of the law comes and asks Jesus what he thinks the greatest commandment is, we realize this question has some history to it, which means one wrong answer and there could be trouble. See, the Old Testament is a big book. And Jesus could have gone in many different directions. He could have argued that keeping the Sabbath was the most important since it's focused on worship. He could have said honoring one's parents was most important because it emphasized family values. He could have talked about justice or keeping socially distanced from Gentiles, or he could have talked about being holy as being the most important. Jesus could have chosen any of these things or more, but he doesn't. The teacher of the law asks, what's most important, Jesus? What is the greatest thing we should do with our lives? And Jesus says, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now note what Jesus is doing here. He quotes the Shema just as it is found in Deuteronomy 6, but he adds a verse to the Shema from Leviticus 19. Now that is something you usually don't do. What would happen if in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, I added a few lines and give us today our daily bread and may your people see each Sunday as Pastor Appreciation Day and bless me with a significant financial gift and lead us not into temptation. I hope you would notice that and I hope you would have a problem with that 
But that is similar to what Jesus is doing here. He adds to an established, well-known creed. Every day, faithful Jews would ask themselves what the most important thing was for them to do, and they would recite the Shema as their answer. They were to love God by following the Torah. But now, Jesus comes along and says, true, we are to love God, but we are also to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, this is not some minor change. Jesus is saying it's not good enough simply to say you love God. You have to demonstrate that love by loving your neighbors. And who are these neighbors? Jesus makes it clear that our neighbor is anyone God puts in our path, regardless if they are a stranger, a Gentile, a sinner, an enemy, or someone who is different from us racially, culturally, morally, or in any other way. We are called to love the person God puts in our path. And this love is what will define us. We are to be all about love. Love is the highest value and the greatest good. But this makes little sense to a lot of people. They hear us talk about love being the defining characteristic of our faith. But then they look at the Bible and see that it accepts slavery and oppresses women. And they can't put those two pieces together. It seems like we are talking out of both sides of our mouths. For them, we talk about love but act with hate. We open our Bibles and say it teaches us to love. But then we turn a few pages and read how slavery is allowed and slaves are to obey their earthly masters and how men are the head and women are to remain silent. And that doesn't sound loving. I get that. But here's the thing. Listen carefully here. You just can't read the Bible and say this is what it means. Instead, you have to interpret what you read so that you can see what it means. And part of interpreting the Bible is setting every passage in its proper place in the overarching story of the Bible. See, there is a redemptive trajectory in the Bible. There's promise and fulfillment, and everything is moving towards the coming of God's kingdom on earth where all promises will become reality. And in that kingdom, all things will be put to rights, and justice and restoration and love will be our inheritance. So in order to understand any topic in the Bible, we have to start at the end and read backwards. So let's use what the Bible says about slaves and about women and see how this plays out. And thankfully, we have one verse that gives us a clear vision for both slaves and women. This is God's kingdom vision for women and slaves. Paul writes in Galatians 3, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the trajectory. That's where we're all headed. No division, no distinction, no superiority, just love in Christ Jesus. And now we are called to live in light of this promise and move towards it. But already in the Bible, we see this trajectory at work. Slaves in the Old Testament, while granted still slaves, had far more protections and far more rights than slaves did in the surrounding ancient Near East. And slaves in the New Testament were given a new status because Jesus identified himself as a slave. In Matthew 20, Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow! 
And we only have to think of Miriam and Ruth and, and Esther and Deborah to see that women in the Old Testament were highly esteemed. But it is in the Gospels where we see a perspective on women that is shockingly, shockingly countercultural. Simply put, Jesus highly valued women. Every interaction Jesus has with a woman is positive in the Gospels. And women in the Gospels, when they go through a trial, they always pass. The men desert Jesus in the garden, but the women are faithful to the end and even gather at the cross to stand with him in his agony. And it is the women who are the first witnesses of the resurrection. No one, no one, no one expected this level of discipleship from women. So far from being denigrated, women are given positions of great leadership and honor in the church. This is all part of the redemptive trajectory. Things are moving in the right direction. God's kingdom is coming to earth and we are reaching out for it. But this trajectory is not just a Bible thing and it's not just a future thing, it's a history thing. One quick example, in the early second century, the Roman magistrate Pliny the Younger sent a letter to the emperor recounting how he arrested two leaders, two deacons of the church and tortured them to gain information about this Jesus cult that was spreading across the empire. And who were these two leaders? We don't know their names, but here's how Pliny described them. They were two female slaves who were called deacons. Don't miss that. Slaves who were women occupied leadership roles in the early church. That should not surprise us. The population of the early church was primarily made up of women and slaves. So it is not surprising that women and slaves were leaders in the church. There's our trajectory. No division, no distinction of class, just unity in Christ Jesus. See, you can't just read the Bible and think that's what it means. You have to interpret what you read, and you have to read it in light of its redemptive trajectory. The story is moving towards God's kingdom of love, of justice, of equality, and of oneness. Now that is truly some good, good news. But I will grant you, just reading the Bible, things don't look so loving. If we just read what the Bible says about slavery and didn't interpret it, we would all struggle mightily. Look at Exodus 21. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Underline those last words, the slave is their property. Flip over to Ephesians 6. Paul says to slaves, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Underline those words, slaves, obey. Look at Titus 2. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Underline those words, subject to their masters in everything. Look at those underlined words. I think we would all agree that they are morally appalling, but we're not done. Look at what the Bible doesn't say. The Bible never says slavery is wrong or immoral or an abomination, and it never even calls it a sin. Again, 
The Bible never calls for slave owners to release their slaves. It would have been a very simple thing, but it never happens. Again, the Bible never makes a statement about the horror of slavery, even though it is estimated that 250,000 people were sold as slaves each year in Rome. A humanitarian crisis was happening in plain sight, and yet the Bible remains silent. And again, the Bible never says owning a slave is a direct violation of the greatest commandments to love God and to love our neighbor. You can see why some people are appalled by the Bible's view on slavery. Because if there is one thing we all know and agree upon, it is that owning another person is morally wrong. Now, some people will argue that the slavery back then in the ancient world was different from the slavery that was practiced here. Scott McKnight writes, in the history of the church, there has been a mistaken contention that new world slavery was worse than ancient slavery. The evidence, however, is against this. Slavery in both situations was about involuntary ownership and brutality was found both in the ancient world and in new world slavery. So how can we reconcile Jesus' command to love our neighbor with the Bible's failure to condemn slavery? Before I answer that question, I guess I want to say that I do sincerely wish the Bible had come right out and said that owning another person who was made in the image of God was an utter abomination of the vilest sort. I truly wish that had happened. If it had, maybe people that I greatly respect, people like Jonathan Edwards and hundreds of other Christ followers, would not have owned slaves. But I fear that even if the Bible outlawed slavery, some Christians would have found a way to do what they wanted to do because slavery meant more money. And money is often an evil that blinds us to what is right and to what is wrong. Harriet Jacobs was a slave who became an author. Her words describing her mistress are chilling. She wrote, My mistress had taught me the precepts of God's word. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. But I was her slave, and I suppose she did not recognize me as her neighbor. That is a brutal indictment on all who turn a blind eye to the needs around them, especially to the needs of those in bondage. But back to the question at hand. How can we reconcile Jesus' command to love with the Bible's failure to condemn slavery? My answer is going to surprise you. I believe the Bible does condemn slavery, but it does so on the layaway plan. I wish it did same-day delivery, but it doesn't, and so we have to wait. Think about the many ways the Bible speaks against slavery. The command to love our neighbor as ourselves is impossible to keep if we are an advocate for slavery. Jesus' first sermon proclaimed good news to the poor, freedom for prisoners, and setting the oppressed free. That describes slavery to a T and infers that Jesus came to abolish it. The golden rule, which states, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, obliterates the very notion of slavery. But the greatest statement against slavery comes in Paul's letter to Philemon, Philemon the slave owner, about his runaway slave Onesimus. The whole letter skillfully undermines the idea of slavery, but one line in particular kills it. Paul says about Onesimus the slave, perhaps the reason Onesimus was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Here's the line, no longer as a slave, 
but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul is asking a question that is impossible to answer. How can you own your own brother and treat him as property and use him as a slave? When we see people in that lens, slavery is impossible. But that is how Jesus calls us to see everyone. And that is why Christ followers from the second century on have oppressed slavery and have led the way to abolishing it. True, I wish the Bible had come right out and said it, but it didn't. But it paved the way so that those who took Jesus' command to love our neighbors seriously would stand up and oppose this evil. Oh, and just in case you forgot, there are 40.3 million slaves today in the world. If we believe in love, if we believe that Jesus calls us to love God and to love our neighbor, how are we to respond to that need? Let's change gears. Again, if you read a few verses out of context, you may walk away thinking the Bible has a low view of women and a notable lack of love for their whole gender. Consider what Paul says first from Romans 14, uh, from 1 Corinthians 14. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And second, if that wasn't upsetting enough for some of you, listen to 1 Timothy 2. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, granted, some take these verses as God's design and find joy in that calling. But others see these prohibitions as cultural and only applicable in that particular context in that particular day. Just like the command to greet one another with a holy kiss is cultural and not applicable directly to our day. How do we decide? I think the best way to solve this is to ask, what do we see women doing in the New Testament? If we only see women sitting in silence, then maybe these verses are speaking to us today. But if we see women involved in ministries of teaching and leading, then we need to acknowledge that these prohibitions are not relevant to us today. And what do we see? We see women doing all sorts of things. Look at Romans 16. We're just going to stick here for the next few seconds. There are 29 names in Romans 16 to whom Paul sends greetings. Ten of those are women. Phoebe, one of the ten, is said to be a deacon. She also more than likely was the one who carried and read Paul's letter to the church and explained its contents to them. What letter? you ask. The letter that we call the Book of Romans. Lots of scholars have written commentaries on the Book of Romans in order to mine its great theological depths. Phoebe was the first. Another of the ten, Priscilla, Paul describes as a co-worker. Interestingly, it was common in the ancient world to put the prominent person first when speaking about two individuals. We see this, for instance, in Barnabas and Paul. And then when Paul gets going, it's always Paul and Barnabas. Here it is always Priscilla and her husband Aquila, because Priscilla is the better teacher and leader. Then there are four women mentioned who are said to have worked very hard in the Lord for the sake of the gospel. But I skipped over the most notable one on the list. Romans 16, 7 says, 
Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who have been imprisoned with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Did you catch that? Andronicus, the husband, and Junia, the wife, are called outstanding among the apostles. Now, this could mean that the male apostles considered them outstanding disciples. But it could also mean that this couple, both of them, were prominent apostles in the church, which would mean that Junia, the wife, was an apostle. This was the way the early church father, St. Christosom, understood this passage. He wrote, to be an apostle is something great, but to be outstanding among the apostles. Just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. They were outstanding on the basis of their works and virtuous actions. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title apostle. In other words, Junia was an apostle. So now we can answer the question. I would argue, based on everything that these women were doing, that the verses that prohibit women from leadership roles has to be culturally bound and applicable only to that particular day. Now, I know a lot of people, even some very good friends of mine, will disagree with my conclusion here, and they have really good reasons for doing so. But as I read it, it seems clear. The Bible, far from denigrating women, empowers them to do all sorts of ministry, including being apostles, deacons, teachers, missionaries, workers, and theologians. That's a whole lot of love for women. But sadly, we often overlook the amazing contributions of women in the Bible and in the church. Rachel Held Evans makes the same point, but with a definite sense of humor, using Christmas as the backdrop. She writes, from the baking aisle to the post office line to the wrapping paper bin in the attic, women populate every dark corner of Christmas. Who got up at 4 a.m. to put the ham in the oven? A woman. Who sent the Christmas card describing her 18-year-old son's incarceration as a short break before college? A woman. Who remembered to include batteries at the bottom of each stocking? A woman. And who gets credit for pulling it all off? Santa. That's right, a man. But maybe now we won't be so easily distracted and we'll be able to celebrate all that the women did in the Bible. Bottom line, you can't just read the Bible and say that is what it means. You have to interpret what we read and set it in a context. And when we do that, what was a frustrating book that seemed to allow slavery and, and, oppress, and the oppression of women becomes a masterpiece of love and a portrait of God's beauty and wisdom and truth. Teresa of Avila said it this way, it is love alone that gives worth to all things. Now that is some truly good news. Let's pray. Father God, of all the things that we love so much, love is at the top of the list, but we are so bad at love. We are so selfish and self-consumed that we don't often look to the needs of others. The statistic that there are 40 million slaves in the world today shocks us, but we do very little to help them. Our whole culture is based on arguing with one another and hating one another. We look down on all sorts of people. We want nothing to do with all sorts of people. We know these words. We recite them often that we are to love you with all of our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We even understand that we are called to love our enemy, but we don't. Forgive us 
our sin. Forgive us for our lack of love. Forgive us for our indifference. Teach us to love. Teach us to love as Jesus loved. And I pray this in his holy and powerful name and his loving name. Amen. The blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. God bless you all. Amen.